Hi everyone, my name is Matt. Um, I am working on this project called Plotly. We are a um, graphing and analytics platform, and I will start off by showing a little about it. So I like to always show this when I start to notice. So three years ago, I was working in DC at this place called SCOTUS Blog, which is this awesome Supreme Court blog. Uh, and um, wearing a suit and tie to work every day, Boo. which I, I uh, <laughs> it was terrible. And uh, I worked on this research project about the Supreme Court. Um, and one of the components of it was I wanted to make some graphs. And um, so I started using like R and ggplot2 because I had a friend who was really into it. And then I started using um, Python because I was accessing a bunch of data from APIs. Um, and then I ended up having a bunch of you know like databases that I had built, and so I had this really crazy kind of funnel where I would query a database and pull down data from it, and then have like CSV and Excel files that I would sporadically edit, and then I would clean some of the data with R or Python, and then I'd make a graph, and then I would email it to someone with these like laborious descriptions of what I had done and be like, yeah, here's like a one-page description of if you want to reproduce this, because I was working with a friend of mine. And then we would email back and forth and try and like improve the work. But that really sucks. Um, and it's like a really unfortunate way of doing things, I think. Um, and then before this, I worked at Facebook, and a lot of the same process happened there, of where you kind of like end up having these different places where you work on your projects. Um, and so, like really when you think about like what a graph is, it's really like a series of outputs of different perspectives, right? Because you have data in some form, you have like code to orient that graph data into a graph in some way, you have a graph, and then if you're collaborating with people, you have a thread of discussion about that work, oftentimes over email, but maybe over like chat or something else too. Um, is this a familiar workflow for folks in here? All right, cool. So um, Plotly is about trying to be a place where you can do all of those things at once and have it be online and interoperable. Uh, so do people in here use Matplotlib and IPython? If you do. All right, cool. So if you don't, Matplotlib is kind of like a <coughs> library that a lot of people use for their Python plotting. And this is an example of a matplotlib plot inside of an IPython notebook. So just like basic setup here is importing plotly, run pip, and then um, importing matplotlib. And then we'll make a matplotlib figure. We can zoom this in too if um, you can't see. Um, and then you will get a, like a matplotlib output. And then for plotly to access the graph via plotly, you call this function that we have, iplot, um, which takes the um, matplotlib figure and translates it into a D3 figure, which is the JavaScript library that the New York Times uses that gives you like hover text. And so then we automatically get like hover text and zoom and you can toggle it around and stuff like this. Um, and it's now like embedded inside of an IPython notebook in an iframe. But the really cool thing then is the plot itself lives as part of a URL. And once we've made any plot, the plot contains the plot as well as the data, as well as the code to reproduce that for a variety of different languages. So if I'm plotting inside of Python and make that plot, and then I have someone else on my team who uses MATLAB, then I can just send them this plot object, and they can just take this and copy and paste this into their MATLAB terminal to remake it, or they can append data to it with MATLAB. Um, but then perhaps you work with people who are not coding and who are not technical, or you don't want to spend three hours figuring out how to move the legend in your plot. So you can go into our GUI and like drag and drop everything around as you would like to. Uh, sorry, the intro loading here. Um, and everything is then inner uh, or is editable within the GUI. So I can take anything I want you to tra change the traces and add error bars and change the styling and the layout and axes and add annotations um, or add fits of a, a variety of families. Um, and then we have this cool thing that uh, we almost called Instagraph, but it got called Themes instead. Um, 
where I can take any um, component of a plot and reapply it as a future theme, um, and then save and share that styling with other people. And so a lot of that is just enabled because, so we use JSON to represent our figures, and so that's kind of what lets us do kind of like interoperable back and forth between languages, um, because like we just have this huge dictionary that's kind of like, you know, within each component of a plot, there are like declarative parts of the, the plot that are like, this is the, these are the traces, this is the data inside each trace, this is the color for those. And then you can make bindings to edit those from different languages. Um, but then like kind of the cool part about it is then we can just like share this. Well, and then we can share it and edit it interoperably with other people. So just like sharing it like you would a Google Doc. So making it public, making it private, making it collaborative or not. And then your files live here as part of what you're working on. Um, and so this was all just kind of like, um, uh, everything has been, like that we've worked on up until now, has been sort of in hope that um, it'll be able to be a way for folks to collaborate between languages. Um, and between different platforms and technologies and data types. Because it's like, if you guys have done data parsing, for example, like that's often a huge pain. And just kind of like data input output in and of itself is like an incredibly painful process. And so we have like parsers that and it's just been an incredible pain for us. And you know, it's like we see all of these different file types because so many different scientific fields have invented their own file types. And so it's like, you know, someone will upload like this new file type that we've never heard of. Uh, and, you know, like Python date parsing doesn't go back before 1900. Uh, and so like, you know, a couple people made graphs with dates from like 1854 to replicate this graph that Edward Tufte had made. And we were like, why is like date type part of oh, Python? Uh, and so it's been kind of like fun because we learn so much about like different like data structures and other languages because we do the same um, figure conversion process for MATLAB and for uh, D3, or for ggplot2 from R and then for Julia. Um, because the core of our APIs is just a REST API and so we just have wrappers that are written around the REST API. And so we've seen, and like the kind of cool thing about doing that has basically been like people build their own bindings. So like someone recently wrote a Mathematica wrapper, people have written wrappers for like PowerShell, we have an Excel wrapper where you can shoot data and graphs up from Excel and use Excel like an API basically. Um, and it's kind of cool because it's like, uh, I think a big thing that like we initially decided we wanted to try and do was using like JSON and REST um, because it would let things be more flexible like as we were working on it, but then it ended up having these other kind of like cool advantages for us. Um, so the fun thing that is, um, that has led to like a kind of a community around it. So you can just kind of like go into our feed of graphs and see these different graphs that people have made and check out what they're working on. And if you're like, oh cool, like I like this graph, we'll go in here and see like, so this is this guy Rhett who writes for Wired and he uses Plotly to make graphs and then just embed them inside of iframes. Um, so this is like, a, so this is in the Washington Post here, and so it's kind of fun because like normally if you wanted to make like an interactive graph, uh, you would have to actually like code the JavaScript for it. Um, but it's cool because you can like make the interactive graph and then just throw it into an iframe with a little HTML snippet and then let people be able to come in and see the plot and kind of like fork it and see the data for it because by sharing the plot URL, you're sharing an entirely reproducible figure that other people can like edit and check out and make get requests for the data and stuff like that. Um, another recent thing that we've worked on that I'd love to get to show is we have a WebSocket API. So you can put data in and run it in every 50 milliseconds. And so you, if you guys go to the same URL as me right now, you can go see this exact same graph. Um, and it'll be streaming the exact same way. So you don't need like plugins or downloads or installations. It's all just like entirely web-based and it's free. We do unlimited public sharing because we're on GitHub and like, uh, it's, you know, it's awesome to like get to give it away. But what's really cool about this is like for scientists who use it and stuff like that, 
they'll have, you know, like someone can be in the field doing or like doing instrumentation and like checking out their stuff on their phone. So like people will like stream in data from Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and do like temperature monitoring. Some guy set up an earthquake monitor where he was like streaming in data that he made um, available with an Arduino, and that was really cool. Um, and then the final thing before I get through some questions is we just pushed 3D graphs, which is really fun. I think we have one here. And so we're actually, so D3, have folks in here worked with D3? Um, D3 is like awesome and super powerful, but I think it's also pretty hard to use um, in a lot of ways. Uh, and but like uh, so, one fun thing, has, or like that we realized was so it's like D3 coverage for 3D plotting isn't uh, really there. So uh, our 3D plotting is using a different backend. So we're using WebGL for 3D plotting, um, and so you can kind of like set up these like cool like toggleable plots that you can like play around with. So like if you've ever seen like this is like the uh, the Lorenz attractor. So we can get in here and full size this guy. Um, and so we can like toggle around 3D plotting. Because like 3D plots right can be really powerful. Um, but they can also be like really confusing, you know, if like the 3D pie chart. It's like, uh, you know, probably does more harm than good a lot of times. But uh, if you have a 3D graph that's representing truly three-dimensional data, that's an awesome way to be able to do it. So if you have, like, you know, the one here that, like, someone made that was kind of fun is, like, uh, if you have, like, a lake and you want to study the depth of a lake, like, a 3D graph can be a really useful way for checking that out. Um, or if you're modeling, like, functions, like in this case, and we want to get in here and, like, look, you know, like, really closely at the data, you can just kind of like keep going in and then play around with it. Um, and like especially for like truly like uh, geometrical or, uh, or for geographical figures of like this actually, this is a globe that was made from MATLAB. Um, and it's kind of fun because you can like zoom around with it and play with it. And then like we can just like go right into the GUI and check out the data for it or check out the styling for it as well. Um, so that's kind of like the general overview of sort of like what we're up to. Um, happy to take questions and then I thought it would be kind of cool to like uh, talk a little about sort of like some of our development. Python is uh, what powers Plotly, so we are Python and Django and then use D3 for rendering our plots. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like what we're working on. I'd love to hear if you have questions and then I'm happy to talk a little about kind of like how we approach what we're building. Yes? So you use WebGL? Use WebGL for 3D rendering? Uh huh. And that's easier than using, so it's easier to use OpenGL than D3. Yeah, um, we have to do some stuff, like some custom stuff for it, for like supporting text um, from like SVG, but um, it ended up working out really well for being able to set up a lot of the interactivity. It's kind of, um, it's definitely been like, uh, it's, you know, it's a challenge, but it's worked really well. Um, and it also works well for, we have 3D streaming, and so it's been a nice way of like supporting that. Um, so maybe correct me if the question doesn't make sense. Uh, it seems like you have a JSON internal format for representing plots and including data and things. Um, so I was hearing about this project Vega, which does a similar kind of a thing. Um, is there any relationship or, or philosophically relationship? And is there like a name for your format? And is it out there somewhere? Uh, I haven't used Vega. I think it's another. Um, it's like another library. For graphing, um, yeah, that, like, similarly sort of wraps yeah. D three to make it easier to yeah, um, but um, yeah, I mean, so we use uh, we use D three to power all of our plots. I think Vega is like similarly sort of like you like um, the new R like the new R graphing library that Hadley Wickham is working on uses Vega to render their plots. So I think it's just like another way of outputting them. Um, we like D three because it has like uh, it. You know, it's a really great way of being able to control SVG and HTML. So we draw graphs with SVG, so it's everything is drawn point by point. And so that's kind of like what enables like really like cool, like being able to like zoom and like showing like hover text, because you can just put a ton of different stuff inside of it. Right, but what I mean I guess is you have some 
format. So like, is there a spec for the format? Is there a name for the format? Like, is your format going to be interoperable if other people want to like extend it? We have Plotly.js, which we have made as a, like it's our JavaScript library, um, and then <coughs> we package that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like we, uh, you know, we intend to probably like open source more and more stuff. Like right now, all of like our figure converters from Matplotlib and Matlab and Excel and stuff like that are all on GitHub. Um, and like our the JSON dictionary that we use is like it's pretty apparent from like how we set it up and. Um, you know, we would love to be able to have it be kind of like a, a useful dictionary for passing things between languages. Because like right now, that's kind of like, that was a huge challenge of like, you know, figuring out like what like geomes in ggplot2 match to like a particular part of like our JSON format. Um, so, I mean, you know, like ours has just kind of been like adding, at like expanding our dictionary as we expand the plot types that we cover. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it sounds like maybe it, it sounds like as you open source more, maybe, or as people start to work with, it could become in sort of a, a layer of interoperability. Is that the idea? Yeah, I mean that's what we hope. Um, you know, and like that's uh, that's like why we've kind of tried to approach it from a REST standpoint, because it means that you don't have to like be beholden to the components of a particular language, um, and you can kind of like easily like get things in and out. Um, because there's, you know, it's like sharing between languages right now, like if I want to work with you and you're using MATLAB and I'm using Python, like there's no middle ground for us to share things to. And that's like why we have used JSON, is because it's just like, it lets us represent things in a very neutral and declarative way that can then like come back down into another language. Yes? So. You mentioned this kind of like I'm sharing between different languages and whatnot. Have you found any cases where there are like limitations with one language or another where you can't do a straight conversion? And if so, like how did you deal with that? Yeah, um, I think uh, a lot of it. So some one limitation that we're hitting now is because we have 3D plotting. Um, is actually um, that there are a lot of languages don't have a syntax for it. You know, there's like if you don't like if you don't have inside of you know, X, Y, Z language, a syntax for making potential X, what, huh? For making like X, Y, Z graph, then like you can't really, you know, use that library for it. So we have our own APIs um, that, and that's kind of how we've solved that. So it's like if you're converting figures from Matplotlib and from ggplot2, will you, like we get as much out of those as we can of kind of like converting their like the parts of the language that are um, convertible. Uh, but in some cases, like matplotlib, sort of like once you draw a plot, there are things that happen that we can't really see what happens or translate it out. So the way that it, we've done it is then we have like our own APIs. And so if you kind of like, you know, if you want to convert figures, you can use the basic conversion stuff that we have. Um, and so the kind of like way that we've tried to do it is like if you have something that we can't convert but it doesn't convert, we try and make it easy then to just like get the data in at least, uh, or to get like a basic version of the graph in, so then you can tweak it in the GUI, or use our APIs to do it. But yeah, that's definitely been um, a challenge. But it's also kind of like, it's cool because it means we see a lot more, because people are like, oh, this is like what we do in R. And so if we make something available as part of like the overall graphing dictionary that we have, and like the overall charting type, then it means like you can just use like, you know, your other language for that, where it's like, it's fun for us because it's like there's not awesome 3D plotting necessarily in R right now, but like we're really excited about being able to power 3D plotting for R. Does that answer your question? Yes. Is, are those things open source, the, uh, the APIs that you guys are writing? Yeah, they're all on GitHub. Cool. Uh, pull requests, welcome. <laughs> uh, but yeah, GitHub has been a really awesome um, like support mechanism for us. So the way that uh, we have built things has been basically like uh, we use HipChat for everything, and so um, and like all of our code is on GitHub. And so the way that uh, we deploy is we'll use. Do you guys use HipChat? So exchange it. He was trying to get shut down. <laughs> I got shut down. 
Oh man, it's so cool. We want to use it. <laughs> we have the glass in products. Um, I'm, just, I'm just not going to look for the next three. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we, we used to use like when we were because we're up to 14 people now. We've been around for like 13 months, and we used to use um, email, which you know everyone uses. And then it just got to be kind of like overwhelming, and we were getting you know like 20, 30, 50 emails a day. Uh, um, and... Oh. That's not working for me either. That's weird. Yeah, they bought 14 No, I've tried it for anyone. Oh, uh, okay. All right, well, so... They denied you too! Uh, <laughs> so, like, the way that we'll, like, do development is, like, someone will, like, put something onto GitHub, and then uh, you can... And then we use Circle CI for uh, our, like, testing, and so that'll run a test. And then uh, if it takes like eight minutes, and so you make a pull request against the master branch, and then uh, if it passes, you get like a passing notification, and then you get a plus one from someone else on the team, and then you push. And so we have, and then we have a bot that's called Plotbot that's also on GitHub, uh, and Plotbot lets you deploy from hip chat, hip chat. so you can be like bot. Deploy to prod, and then you'll be like, you deploy. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, or you can do like, and we like check in with bot, the bot every day. Nice. And you're like, here's what I did yesterday, here's what's blocking. And it's like, oh, like, how did this thing go yesterday? And like, good. And then it'll be like, send you gifts if you do good pushes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty fun. Um, and that's kind of been like fun because it's like, you know, if, if it's not fun, like, what's the point? Um, so, um, yeah, that's kind of like, like Plotly and what, all of that, like, I necessarily had. I don't know if folks have, like, other questions yet. You're speaking tomorrow as well? Yeah. So what are you going to say tomorrow that you didn't say here? I'm going to make a bunch more graphs. More graphs? Yeah. Because I'm going to just, like, use the GUI a lot, which is, like, what is kind of, like, really fun. So we have a ton of, so, like, our, um, we initially... Uh, so like when we first started Plotly, it was like much more going to be kind of like what, um, like we envisioned having like a lot of different sandboxes, so we had a Python sandbox and we had a lot of fitting tools and stuff like that. Um, but then we started getting a bunch of users who were like, oh, like I don't know Python, um, but I want to make graphs. And like I don't, you know, and we had all these high schoolers who started using it and uh, were like, oh yeah, like, you know. Excel doesn't make, you know, XYZ type like box plots or something like that. And um, so now we have a Chrome app that has like 26,000 users on it. And uh, they're basically all high school students. Um, and it's pretty cool because like all of them are just using the GUI. Uh, and so they'll like, you know, import, because we have, we can like, you know, you can just like upload files from like Dropbox and Google Drive and Excel files and stuff like that. And they'll upload a file and like make a plot and like share it with their class or share it with their teacher and then you know edit it inside the GUI. And I got an email yesterday from a seventh grader that was like, this thing wasn't like super intuitive. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> but like that's awesome. Because I sent my first email when I was in eighth grade. Uh, and this kid was like, yeah, 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 like this fit thing, blah blah blah. And I was like, wow. Like, I was using like an abacus and a TI. <laughs> but you know, so it's been like the GUI has been like a fun thing because it means like we we get to learn from people who are a lot less technical um, than people who are using like IPython and they just have extremely different requests and needs. And ditto for like folks who use it as journalists, where they're kind of like, yeah, I just like you know, I don't necessarily care about like the tick colors and the tick marks. And so, like, that was kind of, like, where, like, themes came out of and, like, why we've tried to make it so, like, when you make a plot, we try and, like, default it to cool stuff or, like, make it really easy to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with the theming and so on, is there an easy way to have the idea of a style guide? Like, you set some default colors across the board, something like that? Yeah, so anytime you want to save a theme, you can just reapply it. So all of these are just like different themes that I've saved, and some of them we just like give you. And so anytime you see a plot, you can just press save theme, and then reapply that to a future plot. Right, so how, how general are those themes? Do they apply to any plot, or it has to be the same plot type? It's any plot. Oh. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's like the styling from any plot that you can reapply to other plots. Um, 
but so like a fun thing is kind of like you know so for example like someone sent me this plot the other day and uh, they were like oh like I can't figure out how to get the closest data on the hover here and I was like I'm not sure this is the best format for your plot um, and because you can like do like change to like show closest data and that'll do it but like the cool thing here is is like this is a pretty good opportunity for being able to use a box plot and then for you know maybe like we want to throw on like some of these stuff and then like show some points and then we have a box plot with jitter. But it's cool because it's like that's you know doesn't have like require any coding, um, but then like you can make them you know but like you can make it with code if you want to. And so that's kind of been like what we've tried to think about is like making things like you know everything possible from the GUI and everything possible from the APIs because like sometimes you know like. Uh, so, like, I worked at Facebook before this, and it's kind of like, sometimes I think of Facebook and Google, they have this challenge where they have, you know, things that are sort of like backdated in terms of what's available from the APIs, not because, like, there aren't awesome people working on it or it's not, like, really cool products, but it's just sort of because, like, they have to have, like, a funnel that's like an infrastructure where they're like, we're going to build our web product and then we'll build APIs that can, like, you know, access it. But like everything that we have is just like always available from the API from the get-go. Um, and that has kind of um, been like a helpful thing. And it's also like if you want to make a product that's compatible, truly compatible for technical and non-technical users, like you have to do that. Um, otherwise, it's kind of like you have someone who's going to be a second-class citizen. Um, and then, you know, it's like similarly, like a lot of people want to be able to export files. Because like as much as a lot of people use web, you know, like Microsoft and PowerPoint, are still the defaults for how a lot of people communicate graphs and stuff like that. And similarly for like our deployment, so we use Docker for everything. The folks use Docker, it's like a Linux container engine. So we have Plotly, as a, Plotly is on Docker. And so like the way that we monetize and like run the company is we sell instances of Plotly. So we have an instance that's running at like SpaceX and like Google and some other places. And you know, we can just like deploy Plotly there and then we don't have to like mail them a server, you know, or like all this kind of other stuff. And that's been really nice because it, it also means that like then everything is just like always up to date, like when we ship them something. Yeah. Um, has anyone ever tried to integrate this into a dashboard like uh, Fana or whatever? Yeah, I know, um, and that's sort of what we give away or so we give away our JavaScript library for any public projects or educational projects and um, like that's what a couple places that have used the JavaScript library have done and then also some like companies that we've licensed it to because they have their own you know like pipeline already set up that's like grabbing you know fetching data and they have like you know some type of like transformation where it's like they grab like something out of a MySQL database, and then they convert it, and then they want an output, but they want people to be able to get the data and have the output. And so people who are using our JavaScript library usually build some type of GUI on top of it that sort of like lets you like toggle it or like define a query, and then it runs and makes a query and makes the graph with it. Have you ever used Shiny? Has anyone here? If you're, sorry, that's an R product. I know that's sacrilegious here. Um, Shiny actually kind of lets you do Um, Shiny is actually like an interesting example of where like Shiny runs R apps that actually kind of feel like a dashboard. And so the way that you can set it up is like you can kind of like set up like a GUI that wraps around different things. And then when you, like if you are manipulating that, it then like queries our API and like replots the plot. Um, and so you can like automate that for people who want to be able to see it. And that's basically like how people who've used the JavaScript library have built GUIs on top of it that I've seen at least. Does that answer your question? Yep. Other questions? Yes. How do you power your APIs on the Django What? How do you power your APIs on the Django Oh, Django REST. Do you use Django REST? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to show you afterwards if you want. Other questions? Cool. All right. That's all I have.
All right. Let's see. Advisory board, Phil, you're up. Yeah, that's a hard act to follow. That is a hard act to follow. Uh, 